Extension Agent for Horticulture here in Collin County. Now I'm here to talk to you a little bit about understanding your soil and what it needs. So I'm a local boy, I grew up in North Texas, the only soil type I've ever known is clay, and those pose their challenges, but I want to talk to you folks so you understand the components of soil, how they behave, and why our soils act the way that they do. So first and foremost, let's talk about some physical properties of soil. Uh, first and foremost, soil is made up of sand, silt, and clay, with sand being the largest and clay being the smallest. Now to put that into perspective for you, if the sand grain was the size of your house, a clay particle would be about the size of a penny. Now, what determines your soil type is what's known as your soil's texture, and that is the proportion of those three particles. If the greater proportion of them is sand, you have a sandy soil. If the higher proportion is a clay, you have a clay soil. And if you have a balance, you have what's known as a loam. And if you have a loam, I'm very jealous. You have nice soil. That soil behaves. So we're going to talk about three different soil types. Mostly, you have your sandy soils. These are very open, very coarse, uh, almost too much so. It's very difficult to keep them moist. They are almost too well drained. Um, with that, we run into some leaching problems. It's difficult to keep nutrients in them. And then we have our loams. As I said, this is where those soil particles um, are fairly balanced out. The characteristics are balanced out. Um, they're ideal. Um, if you've got a loam, you are incredibly lucky. I'll say it again. Then we have our clay soils, like up here in Collin County. Um, very heavy, very poorly drained. Uh, can be prone to high compaction and low aeration, uh, but it's not all bad. Uh, they have some good qualities as well. They can hold a ton of water, which is good when we start getting into drought, and we can hold a ton of nutrients in them as well. The key is getting to those nutrients, getting to that water. So how do we do that? Well, first and foremost, you improve your structure. Uh, soil structure is the way those soil particles are arranged, how that sand, silt, and clay is arranged. Our clays like to form sheets. Uh, imagine a stack of paper plates. Uh, that's possibly the, the best analogy that I know to describe clays. Um, now take that stack of plates and pour a pitcher of water over the top of it. How much water is actually going to seep through that top plate and work its way down into that stack? Well, not an awful lot. Some of it may flow over the sides. Imagine, imagine those, the, you know, the sides of the plates or the cracks you see in our black gumbo soils here. Now, if some of that water sits on top, eventually it's going to you know, make its way down into that soil. Uh, it's going to make its way through that top plate. But imagine that top plate if it was a lined paper plate. Well, that describes the crusting that our clay soils can have here. It's very difficult for water to permeate into those soils, to infiltrate those soils and then percolate through. What we want to try to do is form what we call a brush pile. You want a nice loose structure that's got a lot of pore space to it, that's, that's room for water and air. So when we think structure, ideally you want about 50% solids and 50% pore space. And in that pore space, you want about 25% air and 25% water. That's ideal, and that's the goal. So we want to form that brush pile. So I'll go ahead and lace my fingers together and we can see you've got some space in there. Um, and the way we do that is by adding, first and foremost, organic matter. Add compost. Add as much compost as you can get your hands on and work that into the soils. Um, another option would be expanded shale. Same deal. Work it into the soil. And then once you have that structure built and you have that organic matter and you have that shale worked in, leave the soils alone as much as possible. Reduce that tillage whenever you can. Every time you till these soils, you are destroying that structure that you've worked so hard to build. Please don't work our soils when they're wet. Um, that's going to lead to compaction. It's going to destroy that structure. And it's just generally not going to be very fun. Um, anybody that's walked across, uh, walked across a, our clay soils when they're wet, you wind up about two inches taller than you were when you started. Um, but you're, you're just going to destroy that structure. Um, something else, please, 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 please do not add sand to our clay soils. 
Um, anyone here in the, you know, with a clay soil in the summer understands they're already as hard as what may feel like they're hard as concrete. Um, do not add sand. That's sort of, think of that as adding the rebar to a concrete slab. Um, it gives those clays a rigid structure to bind to, and it can quite literally set like a low-grade concrete. Please, please, please don't add sand. So there's our physical properties. Um, now let's move into some of the chemical properties, primarily pH. Um, pH is a logarithmic scale. It goes from 1 to 14, 1 being highly acidic, 7 being neutral, and 14 being highly alkaline. Um, here in Collin County in the Blackland Prairie, we tend to sit north of 7, uh, slightly alkaline anywhere from 7.5 up to 8, 8.1, 8.2. Um, that's primarily because we have a very high calcium carbonate content in our soils. Um, pH, why is pH important? Well, pH determines nutrient availability in the soil. Uh, once you start getting above 7.1, you start seeing some of our micronutrients, primarily zinc, um, and oops, excuse me, primarily zinc and iron, uh, becoming uh, bound, chemically bound, and unavailable to plants. So, what can you do about pH? Well, first and foremost, raising pH much easier than lowering it. You know, raising pH is generally adding lime relatively easy process um, and, and fairly simple to do. Lowering pH is a much more difficult proposition, especially here with our high calcium content. Um, things like sphagnum peat moss uh, or elemental sulfur, we have so much calcium carbonate in our soils up here that it makes it virtually impossible to lower that pH. I mean, once you get about three and a half percent calcium carbonate uh, lowering the pH using elemental sulfur is virtually impossible. So rather than try to lower your pH to fit the plants that you want to grow, select plants that are adapted for this area and adapted for that pH. Um, I like to tell folks all the time, proper plant selection will save your sanity. It will save you time, it will save you energy, it will save you money, and it will save you tears of grief. Plant Plant plants that are suitable to the area. That, that Cannot stress that enough. That's how you deal with pH. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to use native plants. Uh, it just means that you need to use plants that are adapted to the area, native or otherwise. Uh, now we'll talk a little bit about soil fertility. Early on, I talked about soil texture. Uh, that's sand, silt, and clay. Um, and I've talked about adding organic matter. Organic matter plays zero role in soil texture. However, it plays a major role in soil structure and it plays a major role in soil fertility. Um, our clays can be difficult to play with. Uh, they, that's just sort of a fact of life. Organic matter is magic. Compost is magical stuff. And it can make working with clay soils so much more enjoyable. Um, our clays, for all of their negative attributes, have a lot of things going for them. Um, yes, they can hold too much water. But we can fix that by improving our soil structure and improving that aeration and drainage. Um, but along with that, they can hold a ton of nutrients as well. The key is being able to get to them. Um, and you get to them by adding that organic matter and improving structure. So when we talk fertility, think of your soil as a nutrient warehouse. Your, your soil particles are essentially, they've got little magnets sticking all up off of them. You've got positive ends, you've got negative ends, and all of the nutrients that are in the soil have a charge of some form. And your soil gives those nutrients a place to hang on to so that they don't just flush right out of the soil. That's what leaching is. Um, our clays are very good at that. Um, they hold a lot of nutrients. Um, on the flip side with sandy soils, oftentimes rather than a large fertilizer application, you would cut that up into a lot of smaller applications. Um, so that plants are able to take up those nutrients before they're flushed out. Um, but our clays are very good at hanging on to nutrients. You just have to open them up uh, so that you can get to them, and you do that with organic matter, not working them when they're wet, and then once you've built that structure, leave them be. So it's impossible to talk about soil fertility without talking about soil testing. Uh, if you don't know what's in your soil, 
how do you know what to add? Um, soil testing, um, I highly encourage you, make it a yearly routine. Um, with my pastures, I typically uh, do a soil test once a season uh, so that I can fertilize for my summer pastures and then again for my, for my winter pasture. Um, if you're growing a vegetable garden, typically same thing. If you're going to have a fall garden and a, a summer garden and a fall garden, you'd want a soil test in the off season in between both of those. Um, a soil test, you want to get a representative sample of the area. So with me and my pastures, I'll grab a shovel and a five gallon bucket and I walk around pastures checking cows and digging holes and taking soil samples and throwing them into this bucket until I just can't stand it anymore. Uh, typically, you're going to want 10 to 15 subsamples, and that's about a double handful worth of soil. Um, put it in a non-reactive bucket, and you want to take them from all over the area that you intend to test. You, want, you don't want to run the risk of if you just take one sample out, maybe there's something special or unique about that area you pulled your sample from. So that you're not, your, your test results aren't going to represent the area as a whole. So you take subsamples all over it, mix it up, and pull your sample out of that so that your results represent the area as a whole. For a garden, just take it from your garden beds. Uh, in a lawn, do a zigzag across your lawn. Uh, turn that turf back. Take your sample from below the root line. Um, but like I said, 10 to 15 subsamples should suffice. Um, again, as I said, mix those up in your bucket. Take your sample from there. You're gonna want about a quart of, of air dry soil. Um, Ideally, you don't want to take a soil, soil test when it's, when it's wet outside. Um, it, it's just not ideal. Really, you want it air dry. Uh, please don't stick your sample in the oven. Um, if you've done that with a clay soil, you'll wind up with a brick. May or may not have done that as an undergrad student, but that's a story for another day. Um, but you will take that sample, put it in either a heavy zip uh, plastic baggie, or uh, your local extension office will have soil testing bags. They're a little wax line brown bag, look like a little miniature uh, coffee bag with the plastic tabs on top. Um, put your sample in there to the fill line um, and then make sure that when you fill out your sample bag that the sample ID matches the submittal form so that the lab down in College Station can put the two together. Um, the forms can be found online. We have an urban a soil testing form which will give you your results in pounds of nutrient per thousand square feet and then we have an ag use form that will give you pounds of nutrient per acre. So depending on uh, your operation and what your goals are, choose the appropriate form. Uh, we have various different analyses uh, ranging from the routine analysis which is $12, very affordable, uh, which will give you your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, so your, your primary nutrients We'll give you your secondary nutrients of uh, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. Then you'll also get uh, sodium, uh, salinity, or excuse me, pH, and conductivity. For most folks, that's about all you need. That will get you started. Um, if you are seeing some crazy nutrient deficiencies um, or very strange plant behavior, then maybe we can look at some of the other uh, tests that will show micronutrients. Um, another issue that we run into in Collin County is um, our groundwater is very salty um, and sometimes we can run into high boron. There is a test for that as well. Um, but for most folks, that routine analysis is going to be all you need uh, to get started. So it's $12 plus the shipping to get it down to College Station. Um, I highly encourage you when you're uh, sending in your, your sample, go ahead and tell the lab that you want to receive your results via email. Uh, it makes it very convenient for you to reach out to your county agent to talk about this because you can just forward it on to us. Um, I'm a soil nerd, so I'm more than happy to go over your results with you um, and walk you through it. So uh, hopefully uh, this has given you um, a pretty good basis for understanding your soil uh, and what it needs so that you can get the most out of it. Um, as I said, our clays up here uh, can be challenging. Um, and frustratingly so, but it's not all bad. So hopefully uh, this presentation has given you um, a good starting point. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to your local county extension office um, and ask any questions. That's what we're here for. We're here to help you out. Thank you.